Okay, um, so first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, really great turnout, um, it's fantastic. Um, so this is a, a talk about um, BBC Store, um, which is um, how that was built on Drupal and why it was built on Drupal and some of the, the kind of challenges uh, that we had along the way. And it's basically a guide to you know, how organizations of, of the kind of size of uh, the BBC go about making the decision to use something like Drupal, why they use it, what the strengths and weaknesses are for them. And hopefully it'll give you a bit of an understanding of uh, what Drupal can offer in that kind of enterprise environment. Um, first of all, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm the uh, CTO of uh, Fluxus, which is a enterprise Drupal consultancy. Um, I've been a Drupal developer for 10 years, um, or 10 years and four months, according to Drupal.org. And uh, this is, this is me when I was starting out as a Drupal developer, when I had substantially more hair than I do now. Uh, so, you know, you, you kind of get the idea of this is what 10 years of Drupal development does to you. It, it definitely, it does, it does age you. Um, yeah. um, so just a little bit about Fluxus, just so you know who we are and, and what we do. Um, we, we work on um, projects that are uh, mission critical, so this is things that are uh, need to be kind of highly reliable, they need to scale, they need to, to work well under high levels of load, um, and they need things like disaster recovery and, and monitoring and so forth. Uh, they're integration oriented, so this is kind of systems where you've got Drupal, um, but you've got a whole bunch of other components as well, so you might have other services. Some of the stuff that, uh, for instance, uh, Clifton was talking about in the keynote this morning, where you've got Drupal, but you've also got a microservice <coughs> architecture alongside that. Um, you might have APIs provided by those services that Drupal is consuming, or you might have APIs provided out of Drupal that uh, other services can consume. And also high volume transactional. So this is you know, large sites where you're going to see a lot of uh, transactional requests. So transa by transactional here, this means in, in two senses. One is financial transactions, people are buying things. And the other sense is that you can't get away with just caching the entire site you've actually got to have uh, the ability to serve requests where people are going to expect to see custom responses coming back that are personalized to them. Um, what is BBC Store? Um, so, just hands up for anybody who's used or seen BBC Store so far. Okay, that's actually really good. I was, I was terrified everyone was going to say they've never heard of it. It's a complete waste of time. Um, so, it's a transactional video on demand store. Um, and what that means is um, you go on and you buy access to videos. Uh, it's really, really simple. Um, this is as distinct from something like Netflix where you purchase a subscription and you can then watch pretty much as much as you want. This is transactional, so think of it as being, somebody once described it as digital DVDs, which shows they don't know what the first D in DVD means. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> that, that is basically what it is. So um, you, you, you can buy individual episodes, you can buy series, you can buy collections. Um, and so there's lots and lots of different kinds of products, many different products, many different prices, promotions, coupons, discounts, bundles, all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's got a lot in common with a, a traditional e-commerce store. It's on web, uh, but it also has mobile applications. Um, so there's iOS and Android mobile applications. There's also a Windows 10 application, which runs both on desktop and mobile. And there's also a desktop uh, Windows and OS X applications, which you can use to download content uh, to watch offline. Uh, it's integrated into iPlayer. So if you had the experience of uh, seeing something uh, on iPlayer, and you don't watch it at the time, and then you come back a few weeks later, it's not there anymore, and you can actually now go through to BBC Store and purchase that. Um, so that basic that integration allows you to go through to BBC Store, buy the content that you want to watch, and then come back to iPlayer and watch it in iPlayer. And it has um, 50 <coughs> years uh, of archive content, so the stuff there going back to the 1960s, very, very early Doctor Who and, and, and things like that, a whole bunch of, of content there that either has never been available before to buy, um, so you know, that just predates the VHS video cassette, predates um, DVDs, 
or it's content that, you know, it's, it's long tail content. No one ever really kind of saw a point in putting, you know, series four of Bargain Hunt on a DVD because frankly no one's going to go and buy that. It's not worth taking up the shelf space in an HMV, but on the web, there's no reason not to do that. So just an example of, of some of the content that you'd see on there. You've got, obviously, you've Doctor Who. And again, this is one of the big selling points is you've got the complete back catalogue, every single series, every single episode. As far as I know, I'm not a Doctor Who expert, so don't kill <laughs> me if I'm wrong about that, but it, it's not. Okay. But it's got, it's got most of the content. Most of it is there. Um, you've got things like Top Gear as well. Um, the less said about that, the best of these days. Um, <laughs> uh, you have um, things like Anti Trode Show. Um, so that's a good example of, again, of, you know, long tail content. This is a show that's been running for, I don't know, 25 years, something like that. It's been running for a very long time, anyway. And again, you know, no one's going to go out and buy that on a DVD. It's not worth taking up the shelf space if you're going to take up space in WH Smiths or HMV. But on the web, it, it, it makes sense. You know, you've got that, that one episode where your auntie was in it and she you know, brought a clock along and it was worth £10 or something. And, you know, that kind of thing. You can, you can kind of see that if you really want to. Um, and another interesting example is, is this. Would anybody be able to tell me what this is from that picture? I appreciate the picture at this distance. It's not great. <laughs> Sheffield. Sheffield. Uh, so that's actually a show uh, called Threads, um, which broadcast in 1984. Uh, it's a BAFTA award-winning um, kind of short uh, film, basically, set in a post-apocalyptic, uh, uh, nuclear, post-nuclear war Britain. So obviously, in the early 1980s, everybody was worried about nuclear war with the Soviet Union. These days, nobody kind of tends to worry about that very much. But this is like award-winning content. This is a really, really good film. And it's one of the surprise hits in the first week uh, after the site went live. What we discovered was that People actually, there was this pent-up demand. People really, really wanted to watch it. And they hadn't been able to get hold of it for years. Um, so it was actually one of the top selling items, which nobody would have predicted beforehand. Did it do sport as well? Unfortunately not. There isn't very much in the way of sport. There might be the odd kind of highlight compilation thing like that, but uh, sports generally just due to rights management and so on is, is, dif is different. Uh, no, the... the you can get that on iPlayer, but I, you know, I don't believe you can buy it. But um, in general, uh, it does keep up to date with things that have just broadcast. So you can go and buy something that was on TV last night. Obviously, that stuff will still be available on iPlayer for free in general, but it, it keeps up to the minute with, with what's broadcasting. Um, There's a question that probably people here are more interested in is, is why Drupal? Um, you know, why, would you, why would you build something like this on Drupal, given the alternatives that exist? A uh, big reason is um, <coughs> actually the history of doing Drupal at BBC Worldwide. So they've had previous success with, uh, with Food and with Top Gear. I know there's quite a few people here who've worked on those sites at various points. Um, they're, quite, they're quite big. Good Food is one of the, the biggest sites um, in, in, its, in its market in, uh, in the world. Um, Top Gear also very, very successful. That, that was uh, replatformed onto Drupal last year and has kind of all the, all the revenue figures and so on have, have really gone up from that. It's been a, a very successful replatforming. Um, so BBC, the BBC already knew the platform. They already knew how to host it. They knew the operational side of things. They knew how to uh, how the editorial <coughs> kind of things worked. And they were confident that they could get a good result from it. The other big selling point is the community. So you know, people like everybody in this room. Uh, this is a, a picture of DrupalCon Barcelona. I'm in there somewhere. Um, I, think, I think I'm over there, but I, I can't pick myself out. Um, and the community is, is really, really, you know, it's one of the big selling points of Drupal, the fact that you can come to an event like this. So I think last year BBC Worldwide were actually sponsors of, of Drupal Camp um, because they know they can come here and they can talk to Drupal developers. They can find out what everybody's up to, what's going on. Uh, they can look for people that they might want to hire. They can look for ideas about you know, new um, up-and-coming um, solutions. Um, and they're not tied into you know, maybe a, a vendor um, that might go bust or something like that. The Drupal community is not going to go bust. Um, collectively, individual companies may come and go. Individuals may leave and join the community. But it's a self-refreshing, self-replenishing <coughs> kind of source of, of people who can, can do really useful things with Drupal. Um, so just an amazing talent pool. You know, so for every person like me who's been doing this for 10 years, there's new people coming to this kind of event. It's their first Drupal camp. Um, I think there's always a lot more that we could be doing. I mean, we could be doing a lot more on diversity, on outreach to 
to, to people who maybe aren't getting the opportunities at the moment, but there's definitely you know, a really vibrant talent pool already. And that gives you access to many suppliers. So you've got the you know, absolutely massive kind of you know, venture capital backed companies that are doing really big things. You've got the systems integrators, the kind of cap Gemini's and so on. Uh, you've got digital agencies doing Drupal. You've got Drupal specific agencies. You've got um, consultancies. And you're all the way down to independent contractors. There's a large pool of those. And you know, niche consultants who just maybe focus on one specific area. So whatever you need, there's the Drupal community kind of supplies a full range of, of different options. <coughs> and it's also open source. Um, so this um, kind of goes back to, to one of the points that Clifton was making in his, in his keynote this morning as well. Um, that you often face um, this question when you're building uh, or when, you, when you're looking at your software options internally within an organization, uh, which is um, build versus buy. So for 99.9% .9 of your decisions you're going to make, you're going to buy because you don't, you're not going to build your own word processor, you're not going to build your own spreadsheet, or you're not going to build your own email solution. Um, but when you're trying to put a product out there into the marketplace, this, this becomes a really live question. You know, do we buy an off-the-shelf solution that you know, supposedly already does video and it kind of does some of the features that we want? Or do you build something? And if you're going to build something, do you build from scratch? And obviously the the, the problem that you would have if you're doing that is building from scratch really involves doing a, an awful lot of work, uh, you know, an awful lot of things that you need to think about that um, the Drupal community has basically already thought about. You know, we've already kind of had these, uh, you know, whether it's security issues, whether it's usability issues, whether it's you know, key features out there on, on Drupal Core and Drupal Country, <coughs> it's like the embodied efforts of thousands of people over many millions of, of, of days of, of effort to create something that kind of already does a lot of those things. So you get to kind of have a little bit of the best of both worlds. You, you get all the benefit that you get from buying in a solution, which is that there's a lot of pre-built functionality and, and, and features that are ready for you. But you also get the advantages of build, which is that you can customize. You can, you, you know, you can choose your own user interface. You can integrate it with the services you want to integrate it with. You're not being told Oh, no, that's not going to be ready until next February by your vendor. Uh, or if you really want that, it's going to cost you an absolute fortune in professional services fees, which is, is generally what, what tends to happen. And I think where this is important for companies that are looking to launch products um, is that a lot, of the, a lot of the functionality that you need is kind of below the surface. A lot of the stuff that you need is not um, is not immediately visible. So to your customers, the bit that they can see is, is the bit the, the bit that's above the waterline. They can see the bit that's the, the top of the iceberg. And that's the bit they're going to interact with. That's what they're going to click on to buy things. They don't really care about where any of this other stuff comes from. So what Drupal does actually that's, that's really, really powerful is it, it takes away the need to think about how are we going to build an editorial UI? Maybe we should try that new JavaScript framework for building an editorial UI. All of the kind of ways in which you could you could probably end up spending years and years, you know, iterating on, on, on a particular way of doing things. Drupal kind of, by being opinionated, it gives you a lot of that stuff that's the bottom half, well, the bottom 80% of the iceberg, kind of al already there. And you can focus as a, as a product manager, as a business, whatever it might be, on the stuff that kind of really matters to your customers, which is you know, the front-end user experience, the, the business model, the pricing, getting the right content out there. You know, people aren't going to go to buy something from BBC Store because it's built on Drupal. They're going to go because it's got really great content. And what Drupal does is it just enables you to get that, get that out there so much quicker. So just a very, very quick kind of summary of some of the things that, you, that, um, that we benefited from uh, as a result of Drupal, you know, this is probably way too small for anybody to read, um, so apologies for that. Um, so you get the ability to view and browse content, you know, you've got your taxonomy, you've got your views, you've got to categorize stuff, you know, that, that stuff is almost, it's, it's out of the box. Um, the ability to search content, again, Solar is, is really well supported, a whole bunch of stuff in search API and so on that makes it really easy to do. Uh, you want to edit the content? Okay, well you've got an editorial UI straight away, you've got the permissions and roles, you can create users um, with some really basic contrib stuff. You can actually have a, a proper controlled workflow with permissions and so on. 
uh, you want to create content, uh, <coughs> curate content. Um, you've got things like uh, entity references. You can you can link different bits of content together. You want to put together a, a custom home page or a custom landing page. It's really easy to pull in different bits of content from across the site to do that. Um, one of the things I think is really, really important is actually the ability to model the data. So when you think about what something like a BBC store has, um, they have this concept of a brand, you know, something like Doctor Who, and then under the brand they have series, and each series can contain episodes, and the brand might also contain collections, and the collections might contain some of the series and some of the episodes. And it, it gets quite complicated. Um, but what Drupal gives you is, is this kind of ability to really plug things together. Okay, so I want a brand that contains a series. Well, so that's an entity reference from the brand to each of the series that's contained within it. Um, and it, it just kind of speeds up that process of being able to kind of work out what those relations are and put them into the system compared to, you know, I don't know, going away and, and doing massive you know, kind of uh, database diagrams and, uh, and all of this kind of stuff. It's, it's very, very practical and pragmatic. Um, it also gives you tools to help migrate the data. Um, so getting the data into Drupal, um, the stuff that appears on BBC Store doesn't come from someone sitting there typing it all in. This, this comes out of a, a back-end data store and is migrated into Drupal on a, on a regular basis. Um, and this, this ties in with the data modeling. You know, Maybe you need to take the data in the back-end and change it a little bit. You, um, one particular example was um, with BBC Store was that they had this concept in the back end of, of something called a mini-series. And this is basically where you might have a six-episode series broadcast three years ago. And what they did at the time is they put three episodes out in the spring and three episodes out in the autumn. And so as far as the back end is concerned, these are like you know, separate mini-series. But if I wanted to come along and buy that now, I'd want to buy that as a single series. So the migration kind of functionality gives you that opportunity to do some data transformation and kind of bridge the gap between the data model your back end has and the data model you actually want to show to your customers um, and, and kind of manage that process of, of keeping everything in sync. What, what modules do you use for migration? Um, they're, custom, uh, they're custom migration modules. Um, you'd probably be better off speaking to this gentleman <laughs> here because he actually wrote them. <laughs> <laughs> he actually wrote them. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, the gist is basically we uh, migrate everything into staging tables in the database first. And then from those database tables, we actually then do the, the sort of normal Drupal migrate. So that the actual Drupal migrate bit is, is incredibly straightforward because it's just from database tables into uh, into nodes. Um, and then the yeah, uh, as I say, this guy here. Uh, <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, Drupal also gives you tools for serving APIs, uh, which is really really <coughs> useful. Particularly if you've got mobile clients or you've got other backend systems that need to talk to uh, to your systems. So, for instance, I mentioned the iPlayer integration. One of the things that iPlayer needs to do is it needs to know, I've got this piece of content. Is this actually available for sale on, on BBC Store? So that calls out to BBC Store to find out, you know, is this piece of content actually available? And that ultimately goes through to, to Drupal to kind of say, like, what is the status of this piece of content right now? Is it available for sale or not? Um, and then I, I think a big thing that, that people kind of underestimate the importance of, um, in particular underestimate what Drupal gives you is, is security, so just the things like cross-site scripting, cross-site re request forgery, form validations, bug protection, all of this kind of stuff that's kind of built into Drupal. If you wanted to build your own front end, you'd have to do all of that kind of legwork yourself. Um, so it's, it's a really powerful, um, you know, kind of option to, to have that stuff um, built in. The problem is, is that when you start to talk about these kinds of things with, with certain kinds of people, you, you get... Um, an objection that comes up. And I think it's, it's not an, uh, an unreasonable um, objection as such. And, and Clifton, again, touched on it this morning, which is, why is this system doing all of these things? Shouldn't we be breaking this out a bit? Isn't it a bit dangerous to, to have these things in, in, in one place? Um, I would say, essentially, there is a trade-off. Um, microservices are great. Um, and there are microservices in, in this architecture um, that are outside of the scope of, of, of what Drupal is doing. Um, but the idea that you should break everything into microservices straight away, um, you know, make that your first priority, I think is, is a mistake. I think you can learn uh, from what needs to be a microservice and, um, and what doesn't. Um, and I think one of the things that Drupal is really, really good at is it just gives you this integrated solution. So if you've got APIs going out from the mobile clients um, that gives them listings of content. And then you say, 
I want to add ratings. I want to allow people to, to rate that content. I want to allow people to say, you know, out of five, how, how good did I think this was? In Drupal, that's the floating API module and the five-star module. And almost straight away, those fields are available for views. Uh, they start appearing in your JSON data. They start, you know, they can appear in your UI really, really easily. And you've done almost, almost no kind of development effort at that point. Whereas if you start to think about doing this as a, a set of, of, of different microservices, you're going to have to do a lot of legwork to get to that point. And I think when you're doing product development, you don't want to put in a lot of that effort if you don't know if people are going to use it. So Drupal makes it really easy to kind of put stuff out there um, into the product um, where people can, can start interacting with it. I'm going to com uh, come on to, to, that, to that issue now, actually. Um, this is kind of the timeline of, of, of how... Um, BBC Store was developed. So I began work in uh, late um, late 2014, um, a couple of months before before I came onto the project, I think. Um, and the goal was really to, to get this to to the point where we could start the trial. And the trial was the bit where you actually start putting it in front of real users. You observe: Is anybody going to buy anything? You know, what do they find good? What do they find bad? What do they like? Um, and I would say, I, I could say with a reasonably reasonable degree of confidence that there was no way to have hit those dates without using Drupal because it just gave you so many pieces of the jigsaw all at once that enabled you to stand up something that, that people could use. And some of the bits that, that, that went out in that ori original version were, were very rough and, and needed to be refactored later, but it enabled you to get the user experience out there so that people could, could start interacting with it and you could start <coughs> learning from it. Um, by June 2015, there was a, a moved out of the trial phase and into the private beta phase, at which point you start to get real money transactions going through the system, so people are actually buying real stuff with real credit cards. Um, then I moved on to a, an applicant um, beta phase, so that could actually, people could actually apply to, to, to join and, and take part. And then uh, launch uh, in November uh, of, uh, of last year, so all told around about a year from, from starting development. But if you think about it, Probably two thirds of that time was actually spent with a public, publicly accessible version of the site running that people could interact with, that people could, um, you know, could, could try out, and that meant that we could do things like refactoring the, the purchase flow when we discovered that people were finding that confusing, um, and that we could, you know, optimize some of the stuff like the migration routines that I mentioned before. Originally, I think that took maybe it could take up to 30 or 40 minutes for something to to appear on the site. By the end, it was, you know, generally two or three minutes maximum of 10, and most of that time was how long did it take Akamai to purge the cache. Um, just by way of uh, technical remarks, I think there are a few areas of the site that, uh, or a few areas of the build that I think were particularly interesting. These aren't necessarily the bits that went well or went badly, but just the things that, that I think uh, were particularly interesting. Um, one was personalization. Um, and this is this is a really live topic, I think, for Drupal at the moment. So this is a Drupal 7 site. Um, one of the things that um, I didn't go to the presentation this morning, but there was a presentation about Big Pipe or Bagpipe, as it was <laughs> described. I think. Um, and what Big Pipe does is that enables you to serve uh, the non-personalized per uh, portion of a page first, and then kind of stream the personalized bits to the browser after that initial page load has taken place. Drupal 7, you don't have that capability. So as you're browsing around the site, you're going to see a whole bunch of things for sale. If you've already bought that, it should say, play me rather than buy me. Um, and the way that we actually achieved this was basically using JavaScript. So the entire site, uh, in terms of the catalog pages, is completely cached. Uh, the, uh, the purchase flow, the account management areas, the playback areas, they're, they're not cached. But uh, the, the catalog basically is. Um, and we found that was a, a reasonable compromise between performance and technical elegance <coughs> and uh, you know, kind of maintaining the, the cacheability of the content, which was, which was really important. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to Drupal 8 and to Big Pipe to see what we can do differently there, because I think it would be, rather than having to build our own solution for querying the back-end APIs out of JavaScript and updating the bits of the page, it would be really nice if that was actually integrated directly into Drupal. Front-end JavaScript was also an interesting experience. Um, we, I imagine this is something that a lot of people have been through, but we <coughs> went through um, qu 
quite a number of, of significant JavaScript prefactors before we got uh, before we got to launch. The thing started out as uh, very much an AngularJS uh, project. By the end, it was a backbone project with a tiny little bit of AngularJS, I think, left somewhere. Um, and this, <sighs> meanwhile, I was advocating for React the whole time, and, and nobody listened to me. Uh, but um, <laughs> this this was a really kind of interesting example of. Um, at times, it felt like refactoring for refactoring's sake and trying out new technology for trying out new technology's sake. But where we got to at the end is we, we realized we didn't need that much JavaScript. We needed it to do some very specific jobs. Backbone was fine. It's really, really simple. It's easy to understand. It doesn't take over your whole approach to how you build your pages and, uh, and all of those kinds of things. I think that's interesting in, in, in the context of the conversation about decoupling Drupal and how, how we're going to build front-end frameworks that, that work well with Drupal. And what we found was actually keeping it quite minimal, having the front-end framework not make too many assumptions about what Drupal was going to do, and not have Drupal make too many assumptions about what the front-end framework needs, was actually the right way to go for us. And I'd, I'd be really interested to talk to anybody who has a different experience and how they maybe had more uh, more of an enjoyable experience with something like Angular, which, which really does try to, to take over the whole, uh, the whole thing. We also had um, feature flags, which, uh, again, this is something that, uh, that was mentioned in the keynote um, earlier today. Um, and feature flags enabled us to do a much more of a continuous delivery style uh, deployment. So everybody's familiar with the idea that in Drupal, you can um, uh, turn a module on and off, and you can set configuration variables. Uh, what we did with, uh, with feature flags was we basically kind of, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a principle, we kind of said, uh, de just deploying the code should not cause, or should certainly should not always cause, new functionality to become available. So if we wanted to add a new payment method, let's say we wanted to add you know, PayPal as a, as a payment method, um, we want to be able to push that code out. We want to know that that code's there, that all of the kind of you know deployment steps related to that have been done. But we might not want to turn it on uh, on a Friday afternoon. We might want to wait till Monday morning, um, and that might be because. And that might be because uh, there's a marketing activity associated with it. It might be an email needs to go out at that time, whatever it is. So by, by using feature flags, we were able to decouple uh, the deployment of a feature from the release of a feature. And that, that actually worked really well on, on, on several occasions. Um, what we probably should have done, what we didn't do, was release any of that as open source. Um, but I think that's something that, that should come out in the future, really. Um, and finally, um, the thing that, that I found really interesting, which almost nobody else will, uh, was was the, the rights management aspect of this. It's actually a really, really interesting, really, really complicated um, data modeling thing that, that Drupal really helped with. Um, in order to know whether or not a piece of content is available to buy, you need to know uh, its license window, you know, between what dates is this content actually available. You need to know its availability window, which is between which times are people actually allowed to buy it, and does it have any valid products attached to it? And is it available on the CDN? And has anybody revoked this because it contains um, you know, uh, music that we don't have rights to, or it contains a reference to something that maybe is I illegal or has been you know, subject of a court case or whatever, whatever it might be? A whole bunch of reasons why something might need to be removed. And Drupal actually kind of really shone with this because it, it, it enables you to kind of manage those interrelations between content such that a change on this episode ripples all the way up. So you can't, you know, if you can't buy that episode, um, you also can't buy the series that contains that episode, uh, and you can't buy the collection that contains that series. So Drupal kind of really helped this out there. And again, I can't, qu I can't quite imagine the pain that would have been involved in trying to build something like that from scratch. Um, so it's, <laughs> well, I can't imagine it, but I, I, don't, I don't like to. Um, so, I think that, that hopefully, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I've rushed through this uh, or not. Uh, I've been drinking this coffee, which is getting to faster than I wanted. Um, but um, that basically gives you, I think, uh, an overview of, of, of why we did uh, what we did, why BBC <coughs> wanted to use uh, Drupal, um, some of the choices that we made in the course of doing that. Um, and I'm conscious that this is the, the pre-lunch slot. Uh, and that if I overrun on time, I'm going to be keeping people away from, from their lunches. Um, and I also want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to um, stop there, and, and if anybody would like to ask some questions, 
now's the time. I will take no offence if anybody would rather get to the front of the lunch queue. <laughs> No. Uh, the short answer is, uh, so the question was, uh, is the payment actually done using uh, Drupal Commerce? And the, the, the brief answer is no. Um, it was a very custom uh, checkout workflow. L a lot of the things that Drupal Commerce would give you would be things like a shopping cart, which just isn't relevant in the context of, of one-off digital products. Um, and as it happened, the payment provider that had been selected was not one that had a pre-existing Drupal Commerce integration. So it was easier to just build a custom integration at that point. Can I ask more about how you scaled your team within the BBC to build up the project? How the team grew internally and then what the final team looked like? Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, how, how was the team scaled internally within, uh, within the BBC? Um, so I was a consultant to this project, so I, I, I wasn't running it. Um, so I'm, I may be uh, wrong about some of this, but Essentially, it, it kind of goes back to, to what I was talking about in the community slide, um, that there were actually different kind, different companies involved at different stages. So uh, mm -hmm. Acquia were uh, involved very much uh, early on, and they provided the, the hosting platform and the kind of bootstrapping the whole thing and, and getting, getting the initial direction set. Um, we were involved um, kind of shortly afterwards to kind of provide <coughs> um, more kind of architecture and, and a bit more... Um, some more engineering capabilities in there as well, and, and in particular, you know, my experience is, is working on, on similar products in the past, of ITV and, and so on. Um, the way that that scaled uh, was, was pr pr pretty typical. I think you begin, uh, I think, with a, a heavy emphasis on, on contractors uh, over time. Uh, that then transitioned into permanent staff uh, coming on board. So by the end uh, of, by the time it launched, I think there was four uh, permanent developers uh, on the team. Um, a lot of that work was was done by uh, Alan McKenzie, actually, who's the um, chief, who was the chief Drupal architect at, at BBC Worldwide, and, and he was here. You, I'm sure you would have seen him if you were here last year. He was here, very much in recruitment mode, uh, trying to trying to hire the people who eventually did uh, did join. So, I think that's how they they went about um, uh, kind of scaling that team. Who's still hiring? Hmm? Who's still hiring? Well, uh, they, they are still they're still hiring, um, so uh, I think uh, it's not it's not my it's not my job to, 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 to be here as a recruiter for the BBC, but um, definitely um, I'm sure there's people here who will be able to point you in the direction. Yeah. Um, you touched on rights management. Mm -hmm. Was that a module again, or how did that work? Um, so that was a module. It was a custom module, um, which basically um, would. Um, on modification of a node, um, so using node hooks, it would um, basically uh, look at what data had changed on that node if it was relevant to the rights management aspect. So if, uh, if the is revoked flag had been set on an episode, that means that something's changed. And it would then work out which products are affected and update, essentially update all of the affected products um, for, for that change. So it's kind of really using Drupal's node system and, and hook system to um, to manage that. Yeah. So in terms of contributed modules that we're using with this project, mm -hmm. um, did the BBC contribute something back to the community other than um, sort of, um, you know, being open about using Drupal? Um, there, were there were definitely patches contributed back. Uh, I don't think there were any whole modules contributed, but there were definitely patches. I, I, I definitely contributed patches back. And there was one <coughs> To be honest, the, so the, the question is, wh which of the major contributed modules are used? To be honest, it, it's the ones you would expect. It's views, it's search API, it's uh, Workbench, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, panels uh, as well was, was in the mix. Okay, thank you. Um, awesome. In regards to feature types, did you have any issues around the creep of that, as in were you getting multiple feature types going on for when you want something this stage, and then maybe you want to change later on, you have that more and more kind of states of that sound around the same so the question is, uh, with re relation to feature flags, did we find that we had a problem with uh, having too many feature flags, or, or, or just you know that kind of creeping into into the point where you've got so many different options for configuring how a feature works that it becomes difficult to manage? Um, 
basically what we did was we would have regular calls of, of feature flags. So if, if the feature flag was on in production, it was no, you don't need that anymore. You know, because that, that, at that point, once the feature is on and live in production, and maybe you give it a week or so to, to be sure that you're not going to turn it off again, you can pretty safely remove that feature flag. So it's not intended to be a system for configuring the site once it's live. It's, it's to allow you to deploy the code without the feature in <coughs> automatically activating. You find on the feature flags that you sort of need to have things in sync with your apps and stuff because there might be a lead time getting something onto the app store. Um, is it useful for that? Not in my experience. So the question is, uh, did, did we have a problem keeping uh, the feature flags in sync with the app store uh, or in sync with the features in the apps? Um, I never encountered that. Um, I could imagine how that could be a problem. Um, but again, I think part of the things, one of the things you might want to do is actually uh, roll the feature out on the web behind the feature flag, try it out on the web, and then find out if anybody really wants to use it before you go ahead and build the matching mobile app uh, feature and so on and so forth. So I used the example before of ratings and reviews. You know, if you wanted to put, push out ratings and reviews, you, know, you might be better off just <coughs> doing that on the web. And if you discover that everybody's giving everything two-star reviews and it's a real disaster and you don't want that, or you discover that nobody uses it at all, then you've actually saved yourself a lot of money because you haven't built the mobile app version from that point, and you can just say, actually, it's a bad idea, let's not do it, and turn the feature flag off, and uh, it disappears again. Yep. Yeah, so um, so what we had on a, on, a, on a given node, there would be a set of fields that would be essentially mastered by this back-end system. Um, uh, this would include you know, images, it might include the synopsis text, uh, certainly include the price. Um, but for some fields, we uh, basically had a second field, which is kind of like the override field. So you have like the image override fields. Um, so if you had specified uh, an image override in Drupal, that image would take precedence over the image that had come out of the backend system. Uh, we used field formatters so that that was essentially transparent to the to the theme layer. So it would just it would pick the right image from the node and use that. And again, I think we did the same thing in views as well. So it would, it would just pick the right uh, the right image and use the override image wherever possible. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you very much.
I'm going to need something harder than coffee. And you're going to add up. Everyone's doing a roast. It's You caught up with Django at all? So no, I haven't. Is he over there? Oh, there it is. Oh, there well, yeah, I, I didn't go into the, the sort of traumatic memories <laughs> side of things, you know. Like, people don't need to know, right? Yeah. The, it's like it's 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 like a swan, you know. How they say about the swan being so serene and peaceful, but under the surface they're paddling away like mad bastards. Right, I'm sorry. Yeah, so this is what I 